Whistler Means Lightbringer presents The Mythical Astronomy of Ice and Fire Moons of Ice and Fire, Part 3 Visenya Draconis Hey there, friends, patrons, and fellow mythical astronomers. It's time to strap on your bear paws and throw on an extra wolf skin, because we're going further into the frozen dead lands of icy symbolism. Actually, not quite dead. In the first Moons of Ice and Fire episode, Mother of Shadows, we compared Melisandre to the Night's Queen, contrasting them as lunar queens of fire and ice, respectively. We picked up on the pattern of black shadow things, coming from fire-associated moon figures and moon symbols, and we saw that the moon pale Night's Queen, with her chilly flesh and cold blue star eyes, seems to have been a white shadow factory, a mother of the others, or perhaps even the original mother of the others. In Moons of Ice and Fire 2, Dawn of the Others, we observed that while fire dragons play the role of fiery moon children, the starry-eyed others seem to play the role of icy moon children. We saw that the comets, dragons, and flaming swords motif also applies to the icy side of things, basically with the colors and temperatures inverted. In particular, we saw that while ice dragon symbolism can apply to actual ice dragons should they ever rear their head, it can also refer to the idea of cold falling stars or blue stars, to the others themselves because they are like an invasion of cold burning stars, and to Dawn, the ancestral sword of House Dane, which is both made from a meteorite, a white meteorite, of course, and associated with ice magic in some sense. In fact, uh, full confession, we talked quite a lot about Dawn, which I believe to have originally been called ice, and to have originally been wielded by a Stark. We saw how the white sword symbol is part of the icy body of symbolism, just as the black sword symbol ties to fire dragons and fiery black moon meteors. Crucially, we saw that Dawn shares a ton of symbolic language with the others. Dawn is pale as milk glass and alive with light, while the others are milky white and sword slim, have bones as pale as milk glass, and carry pale glowing swords which are alive with moonlight. We also saw that the wall, a magical structure made of ice, is also alive with light, and that it's compared to a snake and a sword and an ice dragon all of which encourages us to think of Dawn as a magical, icy sword in some sense. We also took a look at clues lurking around Rob and John, who are both King of Winter figures, as well as Longclaw and the swords made from Ned's ice, and we saw that morning light symbolism abounds. John has an interesting experience with the Sword of the Morning constellation while north of the Wall, as well as that wonderful scene when John says, so there is magic north of the Wall, but... The magic north of the wall turns out to be a cold dawn which encases everything in coats of glassy ice. And that turns out to be a great backdrop for talking about turning humans into others with Gilly. Then we saw that the curtain of light which guards the terrifying heart of winter is the Aurora Borealis, a Latin phrase which translates to dawn of the north. I hope you guys were as tickled about that one as I was. Talk about hidden in plain sight, right? Finally, at the end of the last episode, I unloaded the symbolism bomb of the Kingsguard. They've been posing as others all this time, and nobody noticed. They're like the poor folks at the Halloween party that just went a little too subtle on the costume, and now they're pissed because nobody knows what they're supposed to be. I'm supposed to be a white walker. Can't you see my snow-white armor? I specifically asked for the moon-pale lacquer so it'd be authentic. Look, I even wrote on my name tag, White Shadow. God morons. Nice John Snow costume. Oh, and who are you supposed to be? Daenerys? Oh, Khaleesi. Right, that's great. Khaleesi. Kidding aside, the descriptions of the Kingsguard that were given throughout the series do seem to match the descriptions of the others to a stunning degree. Now that we've uncovered this connection, it's time to take all this snowy knowledge that we've accumulated regarding the White Shadows and apply it. It's one thing to realize that the Kingsguard symbolize the others— I mean, it's pretty neat, but we have to ask, what does it mean for the story? We'll answer this question by discussing the first of the steamy love triangles of ice and fire, Aegon the Conqueror, Rhaenys, and Visenya. And when I say steamy love triangle, I am of course referring to the moons of ice and fire love triangle, the solar king with two lunar queens. 
The most important ones seem to be Aegon, Rhaenys, and Visenya, as well as Rhaegar, Elia, and Lyanna, of course, but there are several others that we'll talk about as well. These triangles are some of the best examples of mythical astronomy that suggests that we did, indeed, once have a sun with moons of ice and fire, and we'll start with Aegon the Conqueror and his two lunar queens, with a little extra attention for Visenya Targaryen, rider of the dragon Vagar, and wielder of the Valyrian steel blade Dark Sister. Ultimately, what we're leading up to is a dramatic revelation about the Night's King and the creation of the Others, one which I believe is fundamental to understanding the nature of the Others. The answer lies in the story of the creation of the King's Guard and in the mythical astronomy. To set that up, let's go to King's Landing, where a pair of hills, named after a famous pair of sisters, begin to tell the story of the moons of ice and fire. But first... We'll say thanks to all of our Patreon supporters, without whom Mythical Astronomy Podcasts would not exist. Thanks, as always, to John Walsh for lending his nimble guitar playing to our podcast. And thanks to myself for reading all the book quotes. That's right, I gave Mr. Martin Lewis the episode off and decided to read the quotes myself this time around. I just love the Targaryen history and the dragon battles, and I couldn't resist. Martin will be back next episode, though, so fear not. And of course... Thanks, as always, to George R. R. Martin for inviting us into his imagination. King's Landing in the Sky This section is brought to you by our newest Zodiac patron, Searing Abyss, Tavern Keep of the Wine Spring Inn, Server of Crow Food, and Earthly Avatar of Heavenly House Sagittarius. And by our first ever Zodiac patron, who is Dire Liz, the Alpha Patron. Descendant of Gilbert of the Vines and Garth the Green, and earthly avatar of Aquarius the Water Bearer. The official topic for today is Aegon, Rhaenys, and Visenya, but you folks know how this works by now. We're really always talking about archetypes at the most fundamental level, and the events of the Dawn Age, I guess you could say. The real topic is the Solar King, or the Dark Solar King, with two lunar queens. So although we'll be focusing on the three Targaryens who unified and conquered Westeros, we'll also be looking to establish the general relationship between these three archetypal figures in our grand drama. Since RLJ is the other primary love triangle of Ice and Fire, I'll occasionally make references to Rhaegar, Elia, and Lyanna, so we can begin to find the commonalities they share with Aegon, Rhaenys, and Visenya. The common symbols shared between similar characters are what define the archetype, after all. Since we'll be focusing primarily on the queens today, let's first have a quick word about His Majesty the Solar King, or more accurately, the Dark Solar King. That's a concept which represents, on a celestial level, the darkened sun of the long night. And in terms of people on the ground, it refers to the corruption of the bloodstone emperor Azor Ahai, who broke the moon and brought on the long night. According to theory, of course. The Dark Solar King, who rules during the Long Night, is parallel to the Darkened Sun of the Long Night, in other words, as above, so below. We took a good look at this Dark Solar King archetype in the Bloodstone Compendium, and we saw that it can manifest as a Lion of Night, or a Black Dragon, or even a Black Shadow with two stars for eyes, like the Stranger. You may recall the entertaining symbolism of the Black Cat of Rhaegar's daughter, Princess Rhaenys, who was named Balerion. A Black Cat is a Lion of Night symbol, and Balerion is a black dragon. They're actually the same figure, the real king of the castle, as Sirio Forel later says to Arya. Anyway, both Rhaegar and Aegon the Conqueror are black dragon figures. They both have that fabulous night black armor, while Aegon had the sword black fire and the black dragon Balerion, and Rhaegar had a black as night stallion and a black lance from the tourney at Harrenhal. If these black dragon and lion of night figures represent the idea of a darkened sun, then the black weapons that they hold represent that darkened sun wielding the black moon meteors like swords. Of course, both Aegon and Rhaegar took two wives, and that's ultimately my point. These wives symbolize the idea of two moons. By the way, when I say wives in this context, it means the same as lady love or mistress. For symbolism's sake, the technicalities of legal matrimony matter not, just as chastity matters not. I don't know if Rhaegar and Lyanna said their vows in front of a heart tree, and for our purposes here, it really doesn't matter all that much. Similarly, Rhaegar was never officially the king, but he's a dark solar king figure nevertheless. That's right, save your angry YouTube comments. I know he wasn't actually king. 
at a glance. It's easy to see the fire and ice symbolism of Rhaegar's two lady loves, Elia and Lyanna. Dorne is the hottest and southernmost kingdom in Westeros, and it has serpent and sun and desert symbolism. While Lyanna is a Stark of the line of the Kings of Winter and the Kings in the North, and she's identified with the Blue Winter Rose. Although you do have to dig a little deeper with Aegon, Rhaenys, and Visenya, the Queens of Ice and Fire symbolism is definitely, definitely there, and that's what we'll be exploring today. I mentioned at the very beginning of the series that, in addition to the love triangles of Ice and Fire and the comparison of dragons and others as fire and ice children of the two moons, we also find the moons of Ice and Fire pattern with physical locations that mirror my hypothesis about the two moons. The tale of Aegon, Rhaenys, and Visenya gives us a fair helping of this physical location symbolism as well, because, of course, Rhaenys and Visenya are not only Targaryen queens and sisters— there are also famous hills in King's Landing. And it is with these hills that we will start comparing the symbolism of the first two Targaryen queens, because I think the hills probably have the most easily recognizable symbolism. Consider King's Landing, a city built on three hills. The Red Keep, essentially the royal palace, is on Aegon's Hill. The Hill of Rainies has the Dragon Pit, a blackened and destroyed stone amphitheater with a broken dome, which used to be the home of dragons, and the Hill of Visenya has the Sept of Baelor, with its white marble and crystal dome that reminds us a bit of the Temple of the Moonsingers in Bravos. The Red Keep would represent the sun, of course, since it's the home of the king. The Dragon Pit on the Hill of Rainies would seem to serve as a good analog to the destroyed Fire Moon, the former home of the Meteor Dragons. And the unspoiled snow-white marble and crystal and glass domes of the Sept of Baelor might serve as an analog to the theoretical Ice Moon, which still hangs in the sky. Let's see if it works out. The story of the Dragon Pit is quite insightful. Here's what happened. During the Targaryen Civil War, known as the Dance of the Dragons, an angry mob led by a mad prophet called the Shepherd descended on the Dragon Pit and the four dragons kept there at that time. Somehow, they had gotten the notion that an unruly mob of peasants should try to kill four dragons in their lairs. Like I said, those mad prophets, they always come along at the worst times. Anyway, the results were as follows. Thousands of people and all four dragons died, the dragon pit was engulfed in blood and flame, and then, to cap it off, the stone dome collapsed when one of the dragons inside flew up and smashed into the roof, desperate to escape its stony prison. I mean, it really doesn't get much more specific than that. Dragons trying to break out of a stone dome like a hatchling breaking out of the shell of its egg amidst a wash of blood and flame. The Dragon Pit is now a burnt-out and blackened ruin, which used to be the home of dragons, and this is a perfect match for the moon which wandered too close to the sun, was scalded by its heat, and cracked open to pour forth fiery meteor dragons. That would be the Fire Moon, according to the Moons of Ice and Fire hypothesis. The actual description of the storming of the Dragon Pit comes from the Princess and the Queen, and it has some choice mythical astronomy, beginning with the end of the recorded speech of that mad prophet, the Shepherd. The stranger comes, he comes, he comes to scourge us for our sins. Prayers cannot stay his wrath, no more than tears can quench the flame of dragons. Only blood can do that. Your blood, my blood, their blood. Then he raised the stump of his right arm and pointed at Rainey's hill behind them, at the dragon pit black against the stars. There the demons dwell, up there. This is their city. If you would make it yours, first you must destroy them. If you would cleanse yourself of sin, first you must bathe in dragon's blood. For only blood can quench the fires of hell. The dragon pit is black against the stars, reminding us of when the moon is said to be a black hole in the sky in a dance with dragons, and of the idea of black moons or dark moons in general. The demons dwell up there, and boy is that ever true. Up there in the moon. That's where demons and moon dragons live. As the mob reaches the dragon pit, we have an appearance of the fiery meteor shower symbolism. High atop Aegon's high hill across the city, the queen watched the attack unfold from the roof of Megor's holdfast with her sons and members of her court. The night was black and overcast, the torches so numerous that it was as if all the stars had come down from the sky to storm the dragon pit. A storm of fiery stars at the Dragon Pit. That's pretty on the money. It reminds us of the scenes at Dragonstone, where the meteor shower was depicted in similar terms. 
The knight here is black and overcast, which works well as an allusion to the long night. Queen Rhaenyra, watching from Magor's holdfast on Aegon's hill, shows us the moon wandering too close to the sun eclipse alignment symbolism, because Rhaenyra, like Rhaenys, seems to be a fire moon figure, and she's wandered onto the king's hill and the king's palace. So that's kind of like an alignment. And we're going to see that symbolism a bunch today. When the madness at the dragon pit commences, there is a ton of mythical astronomy going on, such as with this passage. Trapped within the pit, hemmed in by walls and dome and bound by heavy chains, the dragons could not fly away or use their wings to evade attacks and swoop down on their foes. Instead, they fought with horns and claws and teeth, turning this way and that like bulls from a flea-bottomed rat pit. But these bulls could breathe fire. The dragon pit was transformed into a fiery hell, where burning men staggered, screaming through the smoke, the flesh sloughing from their blackened bones. This one is nice because we get a link between dragons, which come from the moon, of course, and bulls, which are often used to symbolize the moon, most notably in the Mithras story of slaying the white lunar bull. A fiery bull dragon does a good job of depicting a monstrous moon, which has drank the fire of the sun and is now transformed into a monster, raining down death and destruction. The key line here for our inquiry is the transformation of the dragon pit into a fiery hell, which is just the sort of place that Azor Ahai reborn and his dragons might call home. The line about the burning men, which appear at this moment, would seem to be a reference to Azor Ahai reborn, who is a burning man, a man transformed by fire, especially since right after one of the dragons flies into the ceiling and breaks the dome of the dragon pit... Azor High Reborn's crown of fire makes an appearance. A thousand shrieks and shouts echoed across the city, mingling with the dragon's roar. Atop the hill of Rainies, the dragon pit wore a crown of yellow fire, burning so bright it seemed as if the sun were rising. Azor High Reborn is the son of the sun, a second sun, as we've talked about many times. And in astronomy terms, the meteor children of the sun light up the sky like a second sun. And of course, in classical mythology, the morning star is often the son of the sun god, but also a reborn solar figure at the same time, such as the case with Jesus, for example, and so too with Azor High Reborn. Here in this scene, we have the symbol of the cracked open second moon, the dragon pit, transforming into Azor High Reborn with his crown of fire, who is like a second sun and a burning man and a fiery bull dragon. Essentially, the fire moon is the mother of Azor High Reborn, and that's why we see Azor High Reborn's fiery crown here during the destruction of the dragon pit. The fiery crown calls to mind the visions that Stannis had in the flames concerning the cost of taking on the mantle of Azor High Reborn and of using Melisandre's fire and shadow magic, and this comes to us in A Storm of Swords. I know the cost. Last night, gazing into that hearth, I saw things in the flames as well. I saw a king, a crown of fire on his brows, burning, burning Davos. His own crown consumed his flesh and turned him into ash. Do you think I need Melisandre to tell me what that means? Or you? The king moved, so his shadow fell upon King's Landing. If Joffrey should die, what is the life of one bastard boy against a kingdom? When it says his shadow fell on King's Landing, it would seem to be implying the use of a shadow baby assassin, or perhaps even a dragon woken from stone, using the blood sacrifice of Edric Storm, who would be the one bastard boy Stannis is referring to. All of this is talking about the death transformation and rebirth of the solar king Azor Ahai, which happens when the moon wanders too close to the sun and cracks from the heat, as it is said, just like the dome of the dragon pit cracking open amidst blood and fire. That's the eclipse alignment, And indeed, a perfect eclipse with a complete solar ring is called a ring of fire eclipse. That's why we see the crown of fire symbol in these two places, in Stannis' vision of his own fate as a would-be Azor High Reborn figure, and then at the dragon pit when its dome collapses and the dragon flame lights up the sky like a second sun. So that's your dragon pit and Hill of Rainies. There actually used to be a sept on the hill before they built the dragon pit, and you'll never guess what happened to that. On the thirtieth day since the trial of seven, the king awoke with the sunrise and walked out onto the walls. Thousands cheered, though not at the Sept of Remembrance, where hundreds of the warriors' sons had gathered for their morning prayers. Then Magor mounted Balerion and flew from Aegon's high hill to the Hill of Rainies, and without warning unleashed the Black Dread's fire. 
as the sept of remembrance was set alight. Some tried to flee, only to be cut down by the archers and spearmen that Magor had made ready. The screams of the burning and dying men were said to echo throughout the city, and scholars claim that a pall hung over King's Landing for seven days. That was from the world of ice and fire, and it's a similar tale to the dragon pit. Burning men, dragon fire, and the union of the dark solar king, Magor the Cruel, and the fire moon, which would be the hill of Rainies. A pall hanging over the city seems like an excellent nod to the smoke and darkness of the long night, which should immediately follow the destruction of the fire moon. As you can see, the Hill of Rainies has a ton of recognizable fiery moon death slash rebirth of Azor High symbolism going on. And we didn't even talk about that one time during the year of the spring sickness when Blood Raven had all the corpses stacked up ten feet high in the dragon pit and burned. Sounds pleasant. But here's the thing, it's not just the dragon pit. The symbolism found at the dragon pit matches every other place which was at some point a home for dragons. For example, Valeria, like the dragon pit, is a blackened, burnt, collapsed, and cursed former home of dragons. Then we have Ashai, where the first dragon lords seem to have originated from, and where demons and dragons make their lairs in the heart of the Shadowlands, according to the World of Ice and Fire. Ashai is very similar to Valeria, as a blackened, cursed, and probably burnt city. Valeria is obviously volcanic, while the Shadowlands may also be volcanic, as dragonglass is said to be among their natural resources. And of course, dragons making their lairs there increases the odds of it being volcanic. Valerian cities were made largely with black fused stone, while Ashai is built from light drinking, greasy black stone, both of which are excellent moon meteor symbols. And of course, some of that greasy black stone may even be meteorite stone, or perhaps earth stone burnt black or poisoned by a meteor impact in the Shadowlands. During the Doom of Valeria, it was said to have rained down dragon glass and the black blood of demons, which is more moon meteor symbolism. Black blood, in particular, gives us the burnt moon blood and bleeding star symbolism to go along with the black dragon knives, the dragon glass, falling from the sky. Another fire moon analog, and perhaps the original one, we might say, would be Dragonstone, of course. We mentioned it in the last episode when we were talking about examples of the meteor shower fallen stars motif, which appears at Dragonstone a couple of times. Dragonstone, the original Westerosi seat of House Targaryen, makes for a great fire moon symbol because of its volcanism and stockpiles of dragon glass. The fact that its stone has been bathed in dragon fire, burnt black, and turned into stone dragons, and because it's a home of dragons from which dragons invade. Of course, that's also the place where Stannis and Mel do the Lightbringer forging reenactment, so it makes sense to see it as a symbol of the Fire Moon and its destruction. But you know what would make Dragonstone a really terrific analog to the destroyed Fire Moon? Some kind of volcanic eruption, right? Stay on the lookout for that. I could definitely see that happening. Remember, if Dragonstone blows its top, you heard it here first, unless you've also been on the Westeros.org forums and seen this theory floating around, which is where I got it. That's right, I didn't make it up. But it could happen. Another way the moon disaster is symbolized at Dragonstone, one that's happened already, is through the unbelievably fierce storm that ripped at the island when Daenerys was born, the one that destroyed the Targaryen fleet and bestowed upon Danny the Stormborn nickname. More broadly speaking, Dragonstone is simply the place from which dragons invaded Westeros, just as the Fire Moon was the place from which meteor dragons invaded Westeros and the rest of the world. Dragon lords invaded all of Essos from Valyria, and the first dragon lords seem to have come from Ashai. Ashai, Valyria, Dragonstone, and the Dragon Pit on the Hill of Rainies, all former homes of dragons, built of black stone and or stone bathed in dragon fire. As you can see, the Dragon Pit fits well with this group, and again, it has a freaking stone dome which collapsed when one of the dragons tried to fly out like a dragon hatching from an egg. And when it did, the Hill of Rainies wore Azor High's crown of fire, and it looked as though all the stars had come down from the sky. Sept of the Snowman This section is brought to you by the Patreon support of Sir Imriel Jordain, spinner of the Great Wheel and Sword of the Morning, earthly avatar of Heavenly House Orion. And by the support of the Black Maester Azizel of the History of Westeros podcast, Lord of the Feasible and Keeper of the Records, whose rod and mask and ring smell of coffee. 
As for the great sept of Baylor, the Blessed, on Visenya's hill, it's essentially set up as an opposite to the Hill of Rainies and the Dragon Pit. And this is encapsulated nicely in this quote from a Catlin chapter of A Game of Thrones. Visenya's hill was crowned by the great sept of Baylor with its seven crystal towers. Across the city on the Hill of Rainies stood the blackened walls of the Dragon Pit, its huge dome collapsing into ruin, its bronze doors closed now for a century. The street of the sisters ran between them, straight as an arrow. The first thing I want to point to about the Sept of Baylor is that it's built of white marble. Circe, a bit sarcastically, thinks of the Sept as a magnificence of marble, which kind of gets the point across. And as she begins her walk of shame at the Sept, which we'll take a look at in a moment, she calls the floors cold marble. Marble is the obvious stone to use if you want to build a city to parallel the moon. We saw that at the Temple of the Moon Singers in Bravos, if you recall, and we'll see it again at the Erie and at White Harbor, places which seem like home runs for ice moon cities. To show you what I mean about marble, here is a preview of the symbolism of the Erie, which is so extensive that it will eventually require its own episode. This is courtesy of a Sansa chapter of A Storm of Swords. Sansa walked down the blue silk carpet between rows of fluted pillars slim as lances. The floors and walls of the high hall were made of milk-white marble veined with blue. Shafts of pale daylight slanted down through narrow arched windows along the eastern wall. Between the windows were torches, mounted in high iron sconces, but none of them was lit. Her footsteps fell softly on the carpet. Outside, the wind blew cold and lonely. Amidst so much white marble, even the sunlight looked chilly somehow, though not half so chilly as her aunt. Lady Lysa had dressed in a gown of cream-colored velvet and a necklace of sapphires and moonstones. Holy shitballs is that a loaded paragraph. Shafts of pale, chilly sunlight give us the cold sun symbolism of the other's blue star eyes. Milky white marble with blue veins suggests the blue blood of the others. And sitting on a weirwood throne we find a chilly sort of moon maiden, dressed in a cream-colored, or should we say moon-colored gown, with sapphires and moonstones to drive the point home. We're just going to have so much fun at the Eerie. Wait till we get to Alyssa's Tears and the Giant's Lance, and Sansa making snow knights and snow castles. That scene actually comes earlier in the chapter that we just quoted from as it happens. The thing to take away for now is that we are seeing all of the familiar icy symbols, milk, cream, blue blood, a cold sun, moonstones, sapphires, and, of course, white marble. As we all know, the sigil of House Aaron is a blue field with a cream-colored crescent moon and falcon, and that's kind of the giveaway here as to what we're talking about. The Eerie is obviously dripping with moon symbolism, but it's all affiliated with snow and ice, with the colors blue and white, and with the cold, blue-eyed lady to cap it off. The crescent moon on the Aaron sigil calls to mind the discussion that we had based around the Temple of the Moon Singers and the fact that Bran's last A Dance with Dragons chapter labels the crescent moon as thin and sharp as the blade of a knife. Just to refresh your memory, here is the description of the Moon Singers' temple one more time. A mighty mass of snow-white marble topped by a huge silver dome whose milk glass windows showed all the phases of the moon. Some of those milk glass moon windows would be crescents, and thus milk glass moon knives, if you recall. That's also how I see the Aran moon crescent, given the blue field and icy nature of the Eerie, as some sort of cold moon knife symbol. The white falcon works pretty much just as well as a white meteor symbol, for what it's worth. White falcon, white dragon, white eagle, you know, pretty much the same deal. In A Game of Thrones, the seven white marble towers of the Eerie are described as being like white daggers thrust into the belly of the sky, giving us the white knife slash white sword symbolism once again. So, the Eerie is a great ice moon symbol, as is the Temple of the Moon Singers, and both of them combine white marble with icy descriptors like snow white or milk white and veined with blue. Thus, when we turn our attention back to the Hill of Visenya, it's easy to see how the Sept of Baelor, being built of white marble, is a good start for ice moon symbolism. I must also point out the famous white marble statue of old Baelor Targaryen himself in front of the Sept. That's a white dragon statue, in other words, and if marble is supposed to be associated with ice and snow, then this would essentially be an ice dragon statue. Call him Baelor the Snowman. But we can't call him the Abominable Snowman, since he's all super pious and everything, right? Anyways. Now over at White Harbor, the pattern continues. 
The city walls and palace are made of whitewashed stone, while white marble mermaids flank the entrance to the new palace. White Harbor is a city that sits by a river called the White Knife, mind you. So as with all our other ice moon places, we have the ever-present white sword symbolism. Best of all, at White Harbor, we find a little old place called the Sept of the Snows, a domed and presumably white building that compares well to the Snow White and silver-domed Temple of the Moonsingers, and more importantly, to the Sept of Baylor, the main subject of our Ice Moon Temple conversation. Baylor's Sept, that magnificence of cold white marble guarded by an ice dragon sculpture, also happens to have a dome of glass, gold, and crystal. So many domes. Domes are an obvious way to symbolize a moon or a sun. Sunspear has a golden dome, for example, and of course the dragon pit has a collapsed dome. And the domes at the Temple of the Moonsingers, Sept of the Snows, and Sept of Baylor are paired with icy symbolism. Besides having white marble, the Sept of Baylor has crystal in its dome, as well as seven crystal towers, which would seem to parallel the seven white dagger towers at the Erie. Crystal is a very important symbol, as we saw in the last episode, and we'll see again when we go back to study the wall in detail. The word crystal is often used as interchangeable with ice or to describe ice. The wall shines like blue crystal. The others have crystal swords. And John's So There Is Magic North of the Wall scene uses the word crystal to describe the ice, which the cold morning air has encased everything in. Therefore, the crystal dome of the sept and the faith's general fondness for crystal would seem to be strong ice moon symbolism. Keeping in mind that the seven white tiger keeping in mind that the seven white towers at the Erie are compared to white daggers, and also that the pale stone sword tower at Starfall and the white sword tower in King's Landing unite tower and sword imagery, the seven crystal towers of Baylor Sept could be seen as symbols of crystal knives or swords which again suggests the others and their crystal swords. The High Septon also wears a crown made largely of crystal, and even better, carries a weirwood staff topped with a crystal orb. That's basically a perfect analog for an icy moon sphere and a home run for symbolism. We're still putting off the weirwood connections of the others for now, but of course we know that the weirwoods are often compared to moons, and we know that they are George's version of the cosmic world tree. Previously, we've compared the red, hand-shaped leaves and the black ravens that we find in the Weirwood's branches to fiery moon meteor symbols, so an icy crystal orb atop a white Weirwood staff really does scream ice moon. Or maybe it screams ice cream, since we all, well, you know. All right, so the dragon pit and other fiery moon symbols all used to contain dragons. That's kind of the defining thing for a fiery moon symbol, right? It has to parallel the second moon, which cracked from the sun's heat and gave birth to a thousand thousand dragons. Ice moon symbols should, therefore, contain things which symbolize the others and ice moon meteors, right? Since others are ice moon meteor symbols. I present to you the beginning of Circe's Walk of Shame from A Feast for Crows, which begins inside the Sept of Baylor. The tower bells were singing, summoning the city to bear witness to her shame. The great Sept of Baylor was crowded with the faithful come for the dawn service, the sound of their prayers echoing off the dome overhead. But when the queen's procession made its appearance, a sudden silence fell, and a thousand eyes turned to follow her as she made her way down the aisle, past the place where her lord father had lain in state after his murder. Circe swept by them, looking neither right nor left. Her bare feet slapped against the cold marble floor. She could feel the eyes. Behind their altars, the seven seemed to watch as well. In the Hall of Lamps, a dozen warrior sons awaited her coming. Rainbow cloaks hung down their backs, and the crystals that crested their great helms glittered in the lamplight. Their armor was silver plate polished to a mirror sheen, but underneath, she knew, every man of them wore a hair shirt. Their kite shields all bore the same device, a crystal sword shining in the darkness, the ancient badge of those the small folk called swords. Did you spot those others coming, or did you let them sneak up on you? I kid, but these warrior sons do seem to be symbols of the others. They wear a silver armor, polished to reflect like mirrors, which reminds us of the reflective ice armor of the others, which acts just like a mirror. Next, we have those crystal crests on their helms, crystals symbolically interchangeable with ice, so the warrior sons effectively have icy moon crest helms. But the real giveaway is that sigil, a crystal sword shining in the darkness. 
which compares quite well to the swords of the others, which are translucent, a shard of crystal so thin that it seemed almost to vanish when seen edge on. And since we only see the others and their crystal swords at night, the crystal swords shining in the darkness sigil of the warrior suns is a picture-perfect match for the swords of the others. It's one of those things where you ask yourself how you didn't see it before once you find it. I mean, crystal swords, mirror-like armor. Oh, and there are a dozen of the warrior suns in this scene, which you'll notice occurs at dawn, during the dawn service, as it says. The sword of the morning symbolism doesn't stop there, however. It's just getting started. The actual physical swords of the warrior suns have star-shaped crystals in their pommels. Right off the bat, that reminds us very distinctly of the sword of the morning constellation, which has that bright white star in its hilt blazing like a diamond in the dawn. The star in the hilt also implies these crystal swords as star swords or meteor sword symbols like dawn. And because the stars are made of crystal and crystal plays on team ice, they'd actually be symbolic of icy meteor swords, which lines up very well with the theory that Dawn was once the original ice of House Stark. We've also seen that the moon-pale, snowy-cloaked, white shadow Kingsguard expressed the sword of the morning line of symbolism when Ned sees their banners at the hands tourney in a Game of Thrones, which are described as the pure white blazons of the Kingsguard shining like the dawn. And just as the Kingsguard are called the White Swords, and the Sword of the Morning is a person named after a sword, the Warrior Sons are nicknamed the Swords. So here's the point. Every time we see Dawn symbolism placed on someone who symbolizes the others, as we do here with the Warrior Sons and with the Kingsguard, it strengthens our hypothesis that Dawn is tied to others and ice magic. Here's the other point regarding our hypothesis that the Sept of Baelor on Visenya's Hill is a symbolic representation of the Ice Moon. When we look inside, we find knights who remind us strongly of the Others. The Others are like an invasion of cold-burning stars, and they come from a cold, moon-pale queen. So the idea of the warrior suns issuing forth from the domed Sept of Baelor with crystal star-sword symbolism makes a damn lot of sense, especially if the Sept of Baelor is meant as an icy moon symbol, as I suggest. Or I guess it could all be coincidence. You'll have to be the judge, as always. In my opinion, one of the main purposes of creating this symbolic parallel between the Others and the Warrior Sons is to help us see the Sept of Baelor on Visenya's Hill as a parallel for the Ice Moon, and by extension, Visenya herself as an Icy Moon Queen. Just as the Dragon Pit on the Hill of Rainies holds dragons, Baelor's Sept on the Hill of Visenya contains knights who symbolize the Others. As for the White Shadow Kingsguard and the White Sword Tower where they come from, well, we'll talk about that in a bit. Okay, to wrap up this section, I'll show you a little Easter egg that I think I found in the world of Ice and Fire. It's not really central to proving my hypothesis, but it does seem to line up with everything else that we've seen concerning the hills of Visenya and Rainies. It's a funny little tale, full of mythical astronomy. Just a weird little sidebar, really, to the Dance of the Dragon's Civil War. And I mean that it's literally a sidebar section in the world of Ice and Fire, in the part where they recounted the history of the Civil War. Thus I give you the story of the Moon of the Three Kings. Madness gripped the city after Rhaenyra fled, and it showed itself in many ways. Strangest of all was the rise of two pretender kings who reigned during the time remembered as the Moon of the Three Kings. The first was Tristane Truefire, a squire to a disreputable hedge knight named Sir Perkin the Flea, whom Sir Perkin declared was the natural son of Viserys I. After the storming of the Dragon Pit and Rhaenyra's flight, the Shepherd and his mob ruled much of the city, but Sir Perkin installed Tristane in the abandoned Red Keep and began to issue edicts. When Aegon II eventually retook the city, Tristane begged the boon of knighthood before he was executed, and this he received. Okay, so right after the Dragon Pit is stormed and collapsed, which is an event that represents the Fire Moon Death, we see a dark solar king occupy the Red Keep. That would be Tristane Truefire, who claims to be a bastard dragon, the son of the dead king, and the bit about him being knighted and then killed makes him a dead dragon associated with night and darkness. He was turned into a knight and then killed, get it? <sniffs> like the storming of the dragon pit, the other event mentioned in this paragraph with Tristane Truefire also represents the Fire Moon Death. Rhaenyra's flight from the city is a parallel symbol to the storming of the Dragon Pit because this Targaryen civil war was sometimes referred to as the Blacks versus the Greens, with Rhaenyra's side being the Blacks, 
the black dragons. They fled like the meteor dragons when the dragon pit collapsed and when Tristane Truefire enjoyed his short reign. Finally, there's one more link to the Hill of Rainies with Tristane Truefire, which is the fact that the guy who crowned him, Perkin the Flea, has a name that reminds us of Flea Bottom, which is on the Hill of Rainies. Then we hear of the other king. The other king was curiouser still, a child who became known as Game and Pale Hair, the son of a whore. This four-year-old boy was claimed to be a bastard of Aegon II, which was not improbable given the king's bawdy ways in his youth. From his seat in the House of Kisses atop Visenya's hill, he gathered followers by the thousands and issued a series of edicts. His mother later was hanged, having confessed he was the son of a silver-haired oarsman from Lys, but Gaiman was spared and taken into the king's household. In time, he befriended Aegon III, becoming his constant companion and food taster for some years, before dying of poison that might have been intended for the king himself. Tristane Truefire was associated with the color black via his link to the dragon pit and his being knighted, while Gaiman's story uses words that suggest a bright, unspoiled moon. He's called Pale Hair and born of a silver-haired oarsman from Lys. And as we'll see when we return to the Eyrie, the tears of Lys and the tears of Alyssa and the tears of Lysa Tully all play into icy moon meteor symbolism. More importantly, Gaiman is installed as the, quote, other king atop Visenya's hill with all its ice moon associations. The ice moon symbols generally outlive the fire moon counterparts. That's the case with Lyanna, who outlives Elia, if only slightly, and with Visenya, who outlives Rhaenys by many years. And that's the case here with Gaiman Pale Hair as well, who long outlives Tristane Truefire. I'd also suggest that being a food taster who dies to save the king is really not too far from a king's guard whose role is to sacrifice themselves for the king. Boros Blount of the King's Guard is even made Tommen's food taster after Joffrey's death, so maybe it's not that much of a stretch as it seems at first. Well, that's a fun little bit of the world of ice and fire, isn't it? George can really do a lot of work in a small space, and this story of the moon of the three kings complements the ice and fire moon symbolism of Visenya and Rhaenys. So having set the stage with their two hills, let's move closer to the queens themselves. Vagar is also great and would suffice. This next section is brought to you by the Patreon support of two newly created priestesses of starry wisdom. Priestess Monami of the Jade Sea, the Merry Deviant, Keeper of Winter Roses, and Priestess Hey Big Lady, Royal Seamstress of House Aaron. I have to say that in general, I do not talk very much about the personalities of the characters when speaking of symbolism, because I think one of the main ways in which Martin disguises the fact that he has so many characters with similar symbolism is to give them different personalities. When George wants to use someone's personality to reinforce their symbolism, I've observed that he'll do it with the descriptor words used for that person. And that's the case with Visenya and Rhaenys and their relationships with Aegon. The world of ice and fire will be our source for this information, and it tells us that, by tradition, he was expected to wed only his sister, Visenya. The inclusion of Rhaenys as a second wife was unusual, though not without precedent. It was said by some that Aegon wed Visenya out of duty and Rhaenys out of desire. George R. R. Martin often cites a famous poem by Robert Frost, Sir Robert Frost, I suppose I should say, titles, titles, as the partial inspiration for the title of this series, and it's very short, so I'll just go ahead and quickly read it to you. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I have tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if I had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction ice is also great and would suffice. In other words, desire is aligned with fire for obvious reasons, and thus it seems meaningful that Rainey's was wed for desire. This poem might also be a good insight into the motivation of the others, by the way. I think it has something to do with hatred and old grudges. George actually puts a shout-out to the famous Robert Frost poem in the mouth of Lady Catelyn in A Clash of Kings. Send my daughters back unharmed. Catelyn smiled sadly. There is a sweet innocence about you, child. I could wish, but no. Rob will avenge his brothers. Ice can kill as dead as fire. Ice was Ned's greatsword, 
Valyrian steel marked with the ripples of a thousand foldings, so sharp I feared to touch it. Rob's blade is dull as a cudgel compared to ice. Ice can kill as dead as fire. That's basically a paraphrasing of Frost. Even better, she speaks of Ned's ice, which was forged in dragonfire, as that's kind of a symbol of both ice and fire. Returning to Visenya and Rhaenys, the world of ice and fire gives us a full description of the personalities of the two queens, and it generally holds with the pattern. Visenya, eldest of the three siblings, was as much a warrior as Aegon himself, as comfortable in ringmail as in silk. She carried the Valyrian longsword, Dark Sister, and was skilled in its use, having trained beside her brother since childhood. Though possessed of the silver-gold hair and purple eyes of Valeria, hers was a harsh, austere beauty. Even those who loved her best found Visenya stern, serious, unforgiving, and some said that she played with poisons and dabbled in dark sorceries. Although it isn't a hard and fast rule, I have noticed that many of the Ice Moon Queens are warrior women, such as Visenya, Lyanna, who was almost certainly the Knight of the Laughing Tree, Brienne the Blue of the Sapphire Isle, or even Val the Wildling, although to be fair, all wildling women are basically warrior women. In any case, it's not hard to see that Visenya's personality is a bit cold. I mean, harsh, austere, stern, serious, unforgiving. Are we talking about the Starks and the Northmen here, or Visenya? There's an interesting line about Visenya in the new Sons of the Dragon short story, which is in the Book of Swords anthology that just came out recently, which is as follows. On Dragonstone, the Dowager Queen Visenya had grown thin and haggard, the flesh melting from her bones. This is just before Visenya dies, and of course, the obvious thing of note here is the flesh melting off her bones, as if she were an other stabbed with dragonglass. That's even suggested by the wording here, which says, On Dragonstone, the Dowager Queen Visenya, dot dot dot, as if she were impaled on Dragonstone, with Dragonstone implying dragonglass. You might say it like this, Impaled on the dragonglass, the other queen grew thin and haggard, the flesh melting from her bones. Now, it could also be an innocuous use of the phrase melting from her bones, but it does line up with everything else, so I'm inclined to believe that maybe, just maybe, that is, in fact, clever wordplay from our clever author. Moving from descriptions of Visenya to descriptions of her relationship with Aegon, the world of ice and fire also tells us that, in their later years, their relationship, never a warm one to begin with, had grown even more distant. So there you have it not a warm relationship. Sons of the Dragon also gives us this tidbit about the building of the Red Keep. To oversee the design and construction of the new castle, he named the king's hand Lord Alan Stokeworth, Sir Osmond Strong had died the previous year, and Queen Visenya. A jape went about the court. The king Aegon had given Visenya charge of building the Red Keep so he would not have to endure her presence on Dragonstone. That kind of gives you the idea, I think. True or not, it typifies the way people viewed their relationship. And then we get the description of Rhaenys and her relationship with Aegon, which is essentially just the opposite. Rhaenys, youngest of the three Targaryens, was all her sister was not. Playful, curious, impulsive, given to flights of fancy. No true warrior, Rhaenys loved music, dancing, and poetry, and supported many a singer, mummer, and puppeteer. Yet it was said that Rhaenys spent more time on Dragonback than her brother and sister combined, for above all things she loved to fly. She once was heard to say that before she died, she meant to fly Meraxes across the Sunset Sea to see what lay upon its western shores. Whilst no one ever questioned Visenya's fidelity to her brother-husband, Rhaenys surrounded herself with comely young men, and, it was whispered, even entertained some of them in her bedchambers on the nights when Aegon was with her elder sister. Yet despite these rumors, observers at court could not fail to note that the king spent ten nights with Rhaenys for every night with Visenya. I think this bit about Rhaenys being with Aegon far more often is probably just our eclipse alignment symbolism again, showing us the sun and fire moon in close alignment. The ice moon seems to be, I don't know, standing off to the side or something while the sun and fire moon get their meteor groove on. It's similar to Tristane Truefire, the fire moon king in the Moon of the Three Kings story, who set up shop in the Red Keep, while Game and Pale Hair occupied the Hill of Visenya. Now, speaking in more literal terms, you can see that the passion between Aegon and Rhaenys is quite real, a seeming diametric opposite to Visenya and Aegon. 
Aegon and Rhaenys are hot for each other, I think it's safe to say. Now, when we consider a dragon rider queen, we must also consider her dragon, of course, as the dragon is simply an extension of the rider in the same way that a sword is the extension of a swordsman, or a swordswoman in Visenya's case, or Brienne's case, or Arya's case, etc. As you might have guessed, the dragons Aegon's two queens ride tell the Moons of Ice and Fire story as well. Aegon rides the Black Dragon, indicative of his Dark Solar King status, while the dragons ridden by the two queens have coloring that is suggestive of lunar symbolism. Rhaenys rides Meraxes of the Golden Eyes and Silver Scales, with silver being a pretty famous moon color, and gold is typically a color for the sun and fire. So perhaps this is a good mix for the fire moon, which drank the fire of the sun. Vagar's coloring takes a bit more work to figure out, but I think I've got it, and the key is this description of Vagar from The Princess and the Queen, George's short story which catalogs the Targaryen civil war known as the Dance of the Dragons in much more detail than is in The World of Ice and Fire. No living dragon could match Vagar for size or ferocity, but Jace reasoned that if Vermax, Syrax, and Caraxes were to descend upon King's Landing all at once, even that hoary old bitch would be unable to withstand them. The somewhat antiquated word hoary means grayish-white or white with age, and its synonyms include snowy and frosty. Thus, we can probably assume that Vagar is a white or grayish-white dragon, and most tellingly, the word hoary carries with it the connotation of snow and ice. Thus, Vagar is a highly suitable mount for Visenya the Ice Queen, and would seem to symbolize the idea of an ice dragon. Better still, and this is one of my favorite bits of symbolism in the story, actually, we find that about 120 years after the conquest, during the Dance of the Dragons Civil War, Vagar is ridden by Aemond One-Eye Targaryen, who has replaced his missing eye with a blue star sapphire. Mm, that's interesting. Thus, if Vagar is indeed a hoary white dragon, Aemon's blue star eye makes this pair a perfect analog of the ice dragon constellation, which is described thusly in A Clash of Kings. Asha, Bran asked as they crossed the yard, do you know the way north, to the wall and even past? The way is easy. Look for the ice dragon and chase the blue star in the rider's eye. Pretty cool, right? Now, I'm not one to believe that George would place a rider with a blue star eye on top of a hoary white dragon without intending us to think of the ice dragon in some sense. I mean, it's almost too perfect. Aemond One Eye literally has a blue star sapphire in his eye. That makes Vagar the ice dragon, at least in a sense, and Vagar was first the mount of Queen Visenya. You can see how this stuff starts to stack up. This is a major clue indicating that we should associate Visenya and Vagar with ice, at least in the symbolic sense. It's also worth noting that Danny's dragon, named Viserion, is the cream-colored one, which is basically close enough to say white dragon. Viserion, the whitish dragon, and Visenya, who rode a whitish dragon. And unless you've been living under a rock and not going on the internet like ever at all, you know that the HBO show chose to have their version of Night King, who's different from book canon obviously, transform Viserion into some kind of blend between a whited dragon and an ice dragon. I don't know if that'll happen in the books, and I'm not really here to discuss the show versus book canon dynamic, at least not today. But at the very least, we can say that making a white-colored dragon the whited dragon or ice dragon makes a lot of sense, and HBO thought so as well. It may be that George derived the name Vagar from the name of the star Vega, which is the fifth brightest star in the sky. Vega is classified as a blue-tinged white main sequence star, and it appears in the northern sky. In 12,000 BC, it was actually the pole star, and eventually it will be again due to the cycle of the precession of the equinoxes. Thus, it makes for a good contender to not only be the inspiration for Vagar, but also part of the inspiration for the blue star, which is the eye of the rider of the ice dragon constellation, or sometimes just the eye of the ice dragon itself, depending on who you ask. It seems pretty clear that the primary inspiration for the ice dragon blue star would be another occasional pole star, Alpha Draconis, which means head of the serpent. It's a blue-white supergiant located in the head of the constellation Draco, which was the pole star from 3940 BCE to 1790 BCE. It's pretty easy to conclude that Draco in A Song of Ice and Fire is the ice dragon constellation, particularly with that blue star in its head. 
but I think George might have drawn inspiration from nearby Vega as well. I'll also note that Vega is part of the constellation Lyra, the lyre, which is basically a harp. It's often thought of as the harp of Orpheus, a sad guy who wandered around playing his harp, kind of like Rhaegar. Perhaps Lyanna, who shed a tear for Rhaegar's harping and singing, also has a name drawn from Lyra. The Conquest This section is brought to you by the support of Grin of Long Lake, the Smiling Ranger, Freezer of the White Knife, and Priest of the Church of Starry Wisdom. And by Tom Cruise, sitting on a couch, drinking a Diet Coke, next to a little picture of Winston Churchill. The Conquest of Westeros, for which Aegon the Conqueror is named, provides more clues about Rhaenys and Visenya as avatars of the Fire Moon and Ice Moon. We'll again be pulling from the section of The World of Ice and Fire, appropriately titled The Conquest, which is specifically known to be written by George in its entirety. That's also where we got the descriptions of the two queens that we quoted a moment ago. This next bit comes right after Aegon and his sisters have taken a few castles around what would eventually become King's Landing, and after Aegon has declared his intent to conquer the Seven Kingdoms. Within days of his coronation, Aegon's armies were on the march again. The greater part of his host crossed the Blackwater Rush, making south for Storm's End under the command of Ori's Baratheon. Queen Rhaenys accompanied him, astride Meraxes of the Golden Eyes and Silver Scales. The Targaryen fleet, under Daemon Valerion, left Blackwater Bay and turned north for Goldtown and the Vale. With them went Queen Visenya and Vagar. The king himself marched northeast to the God's Eye in Harrenhal, the gargantuan fortress that was the pride and obsession of King Heron the Black, and which he had completed and occupied on the very day Aegon landed in what would one day become King's Landing. Naturally, when Aegon and his sisters divide and conquer with the dragons, it's Visenya who goes to the Vale with all its icy lunar symbolism, not once, actually, but twice. Rhaenys and Meraxes stick with King Aegon, that's more Fire Moon, Sun Eclipse alignment, of course. And then they head to the God's Eye, which represents that eclipse alignment. Harrenhal, which sits north of the God's Eye, is a castle built of black stone, which was burnt and melted in Dragonfire. And that is, of course, another obvious Fire Moon symbol. In a perfect world, Harrenhal would actually be built on the Isle of Faces, as the Isle of Faces corresponds to the Fire Moon. But being built on the shore of the God's Eye works well, and makes more sense for the plot, of course. While Aegon and Rhaenys were fighting around the god's eye, they fought a battle called the Wailing Willows, which evokes Nissa Nissa's widow's wail, her cry of anguish and ecstasy, which was said to leave a crack across the face of the moon. On the other hand, Visenya's naval forces were met by the fleet of House Aaron, which was augmented by a dozen Bravosi warships. Ironically, these were both Targaryen defeats, if only temporarily. Such defeats proved no more than setbacks, however, and in the end, Aegon's enemies had no answer for his dragons. The men of the Vale sank a third of the Targaryen ships and captured near as many, but when Queen Visenya descended upon them from the sky, their own ships burned. Lords Errol, Fell, and Buckler hid in their familiar forests until Queen Rhaenys unleashed Meraxes and a wall of fire swept through the woods, turning the trees to torches and the victors at the Wailing Widows, returning across the lake to Harrenhal, were ill-prepared when Beleriand fell upon them out of the morning sky. Heron's longboats burned. So did Heron's sons. The burning tree is an important symbol, which anyone who has read or listened to the Weirwood Compendium will recognize right away, and it's quite appropriately linked to the Fire Moon, as played by Rhaenys and Meraxes. And remember when I said Harrenhal would be even better if it was built on an island in the God's Eye Lake? Well, here, Heron's sons are crossing the lake when they are burnt by dragonfire. We must take a moment for the burning of Heron Hall itself, which is described to us here in loving detail by our author. After dropping the mic on Heron the Black and telling him, When the sun sets, your line will end, the battle begins with yet more dying sun language. As the last light of sun faded, Black Heron's men stared into the gathering darkness, clutching their spears and crossbows. When no dragon appeared, some may have thought that Aegon's threats had been hollow. But Aegon Targaryen took Balerion up high, through the clouds, up and up, until the dragon was no bigger than a fly upon the moon. Only then did he descend, well inside the castle walls. 
on wings as black as pitch, Balerion plunged through the night, and when the great towers of Harrenhal appeared beneath him, the dragon roared his fury and bathed them in black fire, shot through with swirls of red. Oh, man. Black fire shot through with red, wings as black as pitch, and Balerion the black dread like a fly upon the moon before making his descent, like a black dragon coming from the moon when the sun dies. The narrative continues. Stone does not burn, Heron had boasted, but his castle was not made of stone alone. Wood and wool, hemp and straw, bread and salted beef and grain, all took fire. Nor were Heron's iron men made of stone. Smoking, screaming, shrouded in flames, they ran across the yards and tumbled from the wall walks to die upon the ground below. And even stone will crack and melt if a fire is hot enough. The river lords outside the castle walls said later that the towers of Harrenhal glowed red against the night like five great candles, and like candles they began to twist and melt as runnels of molten stone ran down their sides. As I sometimes like to say, that's pretty freaking metal. What we're seeing here is one half of the fused stone process. All Aegon needed here was a few fire mages to shape the stone as he melts it and then fix it in place. Without the requisite magicians, however, it's just the straight-up ruination of the largest castle ever built in Westeros. We recognize the stone-cracking, burning man, and flaming shroud symbols, and there is also an unmistakable call-out to glass candles here, as the Blackstone Towers of Harrenhal glow like twisted candles. The description of the glass candle that we see in Marwyn the Mage's chambers in A Feast for Crows is described as three feet tall and slender as a sword, ridged and twisted, glittering black. Interestingly, this is also the beginning of Aegon collecting the swords of his foes to make the Iron Throne with. It says, When the ashes had cooled enough to allow men to enter the castle safely, the swords of the fallen, many shattered or melted or twisted into ribbons of steel by dragonfire, were gathered up and sent back to the Aegon Fort in wagons. As a matter of fact, it's possible that Aegon first got the idea for the Iron Throne when he saw those melted swords here at Harrenhal. He might have been like, hmm, you know what would be really freaking metal? And then he called for the wagons. Or maybe Aegon's just into that whole reuse, recycle thing. Who knows? There's also a quote from a Jamie chapter of A Feast for Crows, which describes Harrenhal like a grasping black hand. Across the pewter waters of the lake, the towers of Black Heron's folly appeared at last. Five twisted fingers of black, misshapen stone, grasping for the sky. When Heron's black hand of a castle glowed red on the night of its destruction, this is essentially the flaming hand, fiery sock puppet symbol that we see often as a symbol of the exploding moon. Remember this legendary quote from A Dance with Dragons with Benero, the high priest of Valor? Benero jabbed a finger at the moon, made a fist, spread his hands wide. When his voice rose in a crescendo, flames leapt from his fingers with a sudden whoosh and made the crowd gasp. The priest could trace fiery letters in the air as well. Valerian glyphs. Tyrion recognized perhaps two in ten. One was doom, the other darkness. In case you don't quite remember the sock puppet metaphor, it goes like this. The moon is like an empty sock puppet, and the sun's fire that the moon drinks is the fiery hand animating the sock puppet. Thus, the burning hand symbol can be used to represent the burning moon, as it would seem to do here with Harrenhal. It's the same with the red leaves of the weirwood, which are usually described as looking like bloody hands, because they're also called a blaze of flame amongst the green by Theon. Blood and fire hands, that's the idea, and you may remember Jon Snow feeding the ravens with Maester Aemon shortly after he burned one of his hands. His burned hand got bloody up to the elbow, and that's the same symbol. As a final note on Harrenhal, I'll mention that Arya recalls Old Nan telling her that fiery spirits still haunted the blackened towers of Harrenhal, the victims of Balerion's fires. This is yet another clue tying Harrenhal to our archetype of the Fire Moon, since we know that Azor Ahai and quite possibly Nissa Nissa are reborn as fiery spirits following the initial forging of Lightbringer blood magic ritual, whatever that turns out to have been in these specifics. The fiery Harrenhal ghosts also remind us a bit of Melisandre's shadow babies, the shadows with burning hearts, which symbolize the dark and deathly children of the Fire Moon. So as you can see, all of the symbolism works together here in the first phase of the conquest. Harrenhal and the God's Eye symbolize the Fire Moon wandering too close to the sun, and Aegon and Rhaenys go there with their dragons. 
The veil represents the ice moon, and so Visenya and Vegar go there. This pattern continues later in the conquest, after the Field of Fire, where all three dragons came together to roast the combined armies of the Reach and the Westerlands, as alluded to here. Now, once again, Aegon Targaryen and his queens parted company. Aegon turned south once more, marching toward Old Town, while his two sisters mounted their dragons, Visenya for a second attempt at the Vale of Arryn, and Rhaenys for Sunspear in the deserts of Dorne. Aha! The Vale of Arryn and the Icy Eyrie, once again, for Visenya and Vagar, and it's to be Sunspear in the deserts of Dorne for Rhaenys and Meraxes. Dorne is, of course, the home of Elia Martell, Rhaegar's Fire Moon Bride, so again, that's an excellent fit for the larger pattern. After describing the many fortifications and preparations made by Shara Aaron and the Veilmen, it says, All these defenses proved useless against Visenya Targaryen, who rode Vagar's leathery wings above them all and landed in the Eyrie's inner courtyard. When the regent of the Vale rushed out to confront her, with a dozen guards at her back, she found Visenya with Ronald Aaron sitting on her knee, staring at the dragon, wonderstruck. Mother, can I go flying with the lady? the boy king asked. No threats were spoken, no angry words exchanged. The two queens smiled at one another and exchanged courtesies instead. Then Lady Shara sent for the three crowns, her own regent's coronet, her son's small crown, and the falcon crown of mountain and veil that the Aaron kings had worn for a thousand years, and surrendered them to Queen Visenya, along with the swords of her garrison. And it was said afterward that the little king flew thrice around the summit of the giant's lance and landed to find himself a little lord. Thus did Visenya Targaryen bring the veil of Arryn into her brother's realm. It's a cute little story for sure, but the noteworthy thing is Visenya receiving the crown and swords of the veil. These are the accoutrements of an icy monarch, given the symbolism of the Eyrie and the Aaron sigil. Also notable is the name Shara, and that's spelled S-H-A-R-R-A. You may recall the Dothraki naming the red comet Shearek Kia, the bleeding star. Shearek, S-H-I-E-R-A-K, means star, and any time someone has a name like Shara or Shiera, you should think of comets and stars. And that's not just Dothraki people, obviously. I think Martin is simply using that sound or word to represent stars, even outside of the context of the Dothraki language. For example, Shiera Sea Star is a Targaryen royal bastard, the lover of Bloodraven, and perhaps, maybe just maybe, the mother of Melisandre. There's also a village which is ravaged and burned by the mountain called Shera, and there's a bunch of symbolism going on in that scene. Then we have the Dothraki word Shikoyi, or Shikoyi, which is the name for a total solar eclipse, by the way, and you can see that it's made up of similar phonetic roots. In other words, Shara Aaron of the Eyrie is an icy star queen in an icy castle, but one who recognizes her true monarch, Visenya the Ice Queen, rider of Vagar, the symbolic ice dragon. And so, Shara offers up her crowns and swords to Visenya. Visenya also gets an A-plus for military strategy here, a bloodless conquest wherein you still manage to demonstrate your ability to use overwhelming force is about as good as it gets in terms of battle outcomes. As for Rhaenys and Dorne, the narrative continues by telling us that Rhaenys Targaryen had no such easy conquest, and that's putting it mildly. The Dornish basically employed insurgency tactics. They ran and hid whenever she came by, offering no soldiers to burn, thereby stymieing the Targaryen attempt to make them submit. Rhaenys eventually came to Sunspear and found an extremely aged Princess Maria Martell, the so-called Yellow Toad of Dorne, who basically told her to take her dragon and shove it where the sun don't shine. See what it did there? The exchange is recorded as follows. I will not fight you, Princess Maria told Rhaenys. Nor will I kneel to you. Dorne has no king. Tell your brother that. I shall, Rhaenys replied. But we will come again, princess, and the next time we shall come with fire and blood. Your words, said Princess Maria. Ours are unbowed, unbent, unbroken. You may burn us, my lady, but you will not bend us, break us, or make us bow. This is Dorne. You are not wanted here. Return at your peril. When she returned later with more Targaryen forces and Aegon himself, 
It was essentially more quagmire, more cat-and-mouse battles across the Dornish deserts and mountains. At one point, Aegon and Rhaenys took control, quote-unquote, of Sunspear and declared Dorne conquered, but all the forces they left in various places to hold Dorne succumbed soon after the dragons left. I hardly have to point out that Aegon and Rhaenys, appearing together in Dorne, is yet another metaphorical depiction of the fiery moon wandering too close to the sun, the eclipse alignment. Although the rest of Westeros was essentially conquered shortly after this point, with Aegon being anointed king by the High Septon in Old Town around this time, Dorne remains the lone exception to this for some hundred years or more. The Targaryens continue to try to bring Dorne to heel after the conquest, and the conflict really comes to a head in 10 AC with the death of Rhaenys in Dorne. Rhaenys, as the Fire Moon Maiden, dies before Visenya, and the manner of her death attests to her Fire Moon nature. Not only does she die in Dorne, but she specifically dies at a place called the Hellholt. The story is that her gold and silver dragon, Meraxes, was shot through the eye with a scorpion bolt. This is a mimicking of the idea of the god's eye being blinded. And this is where I remind you that if you haven't watched the Caverns of Dragonglass video that I did with History of Westeros, you're missing out on an important mythical astronomy concept known as the god's eye. So be sure to check that out if you haven't already. Put a lot of work into that one, and I'm really happy with how it came out. So go to my YouTube channel and look under the Collaborations with History of Westeros playlist. If you didn't see it, the very basic idea is when the fire moon wanders too close to the sun, it makes an eclipse, which looks very like a great celestial eye. The sun and moon are sometimes seen as the eyes of God in various world mythologies, and I believe that Martin is playing on this concept with the implied eclipse alignment looking like the eye of God, which is then blinded by the comet. There are many quotes about the moon being like an eye, or watching like an eye, and one of our two moons, of course, got poked by the comet, so you can see how an eye gouging works well to symbolize the destruction of the moon. The god's eye lake has that isle of faces in the middle, which would correlate to the moon, and the lake to the sun, and these correlations are, as always, well supported by the symbolic language in the books about the lake being on fire and things like that. The main point here is that a dragon, or fiery person, losing one eye usually symbolizes the destruction of the fire moon, and that would seem to be the case here, with the death of Meraxes and Rhaenys in Dorne, where Meraxes is speared through the eye. There's also a brief mention of this dragon speared through the eye motif during the storming of the dragon pit, which of course is a parallel event to the death of Rhaenys and Meraxes, since it's also a metaphor for the destruction of the fire moon. Unable to flee, Dreamfire returned to the attack, savaging her tormentors until the sands of the pit were strewn with charred corpses, and the very air was thick with smoke and the smell of burned flesh, yet still the spears and arrows flew. The end came when a crossbow bolt nicked one of the dragon's eyes. Half blind and maddened by a dozen lesser wounds, Dreamfire spread her wings and flew straight up at the great dome above in a last desperate attempt to break into the open sky. Already weakened by blasts of dragon fire, the dome cracked under the force of impact, and a moment later, half of it came tumbling down, crushing both dragon and dragon slayers under tons of broken stone and rubble. If you've read or listened to the Weirwood Compendium series, you'll know that there is some serious green seer dragon stuff going on here with a one eyed dragon whose name includes the word dream and who broke the fire moon symbol. It's very similar to seeing one-eyed Beric sitting in a weirwood throne in a weirwood cave, yet resurrected through fire magic and wielding an Azor high like burning sword. So I'd recommend checking out the Weirwood Compendium if none of that made sense to you. Setting that aside, the main point is that the reborn Solar King, who's often a dragon figure since this is basically Azor high reborn we're talking about, is often shown with one eye. And this is both a reference to Odin symbolism and to the sun wandering too close to the moon eclipse, which looks like a great celestial eye. We see this dragon eye spearing motif at the dragon pit and at the death of Rhaenys at the Hellholt in Dorne, because both of these events and places symbolize the fire moon's destruction, according to my theory, of course. Wrapping up with Rhaenys and the Hellholt, we read that Rhaenys was either killed in the fall or else wounded and then taken to the dungeons of the Hellholt to die a horrible death. Either of these endings kind of sends the same basic message, which is that Rhaenys went to hell. The years following the death of Rhaenys are called the Years of the Dragon's Wrath, and that's what we're going to talk about next. This will actually be the clincher for Rhaenys and Visenya's fire and ice moon symbolism, and the punchline to the riddle of, 
What is George saying by having the Kingsguard parallel the others? It's this. Just as Visenya's hill contains the other-like warrior sons, Visenya the Icy Moon Queen created the other-like Kingsguard. And yeah, that gets a dun-dun-dun. Azor Ahai's Other Queen. This final section is brought to you by the loyal Patreon support of the starry wisdom priest known as Sir Cosmo of House Astor, whose house words are, We Walk at Dawn, and by starry wisdom priestess Synxia, queen of the summer snows and burner of winter's wick. I hope it's readily apparent that Visenya's creation of the Kingsguard is a terrific parallel to the Night's Queen creating the others. And of course, the same applies to the warrior's sons living in the Sept of Baelor on top of the hill of Visenya. Linking these two orders of knights who impersonate the others to Visenya implies Visenya as a white shadow factory, just like the Night's Queen. I'll give you a moment to let that sink in. If you've been skeptical about my suggestion that Visenya parallels to the Ice Moon and the Night's Queen, this is where the correlations should probably become too much to explain by coincidence, in my opinion. All of the symbolism of the hill, Visenya herself, Vagar, the conquest. But this is really the point right here. George really wants us to understand that the others come from the Night's Queen. She is their creator, their original creator, I believe, despite the fact that most people think the Night's King and the Night's Queen did their thing sometime after the Long Night. I would disagree, as I've said before, or at least I would say that the symbolism indicates that Night's King and Night's Queen were the original creators of the others. Consider the story of the formation of the Kingsguard, which again is taken from the World of Ice and Fire, and I'm quoting the passage at length because it's just really good a Song of Ice and Fire history to know, and it's also a great example of why everyone should read the World of Ice and Fire, as is the section on the conquest. So here we go. Yet, despite a reign covered in glory, the First Dornish War stood out as Aegon's one great defeat. The First Dornish War began boldly in 4 AC and ended in 13 AC after years of tragedy and spilled blood. Many were the calamities of that war. The death of Rhaenys, the years of the Dragon's Wrath, the murdered lords, the would-be assassins in King's Landing and the Red Keep itself. It was a black time. But out of all that tragedy was born one glorious thing, the sworn brotherhood of the King's Guard. I'm going to cut in here real quick to point out the obvious. Rainey's death represents the Fire Moon cracking event, which precipitated the Long Night, and these Years of the Dragon's Wrath, which the narrative describes here as a black time, serves as a metaphor for the Long Night falling after the death of the Fire Moon. This is when the others, the Kingsguard, were created by Visenya, who stands in for the Night's Queen. This correlates to what Old Nan says about the Long Night, that in that darkness, the others came for the first time. It's basically a really tight sequence. The Fire Moon person dies, then there is a black time, and in that black time, the Ice Moon Queen creates the others. The story of the Kingsguard continues. When Aegon and Visenya placed prices on the heads of the Dornish lords, many were murdered, and in retaliation the Dornishmen hired their own cat's paws and killers. On one occasion in 10 AC, Aegon and Visenya were both attacked in the streets of King's Landing, and if not for Visenya and Dark Sister, the king might not have survived. Despite this, the king still believed that his own guards were sufficient to his defense. Visenya convinced him otherwise. It is recorded that when Aegon pointed out his guardsmen, Visenya drew Dark Sister and cut his cheek before his guards could react. Your guards are slow and lazy, Visenya is reported to have said, and the king was forced to agree. This little bloody object lesson from Visenya is a depiction of Night's Queen taking the blood of Night's King to create the others. The legend says Night's King gave her his seed and soul, and blood can serve as a symbol of both of those things, such as when someone says they are of the same blood as their relative, or when blood is shown to be a powerful fuel for darker kinds of magic. This drawing of Aegon's blood is what causes him to agree to let her create the White Sword Brotherhood, so it correlates well to the Night's King giving his seed and soul to Night's Queen to create the others. As for the Dornish assassins and catspaws who were sent to try to kill Aegon and Visenya, they were triggered as part of the fallout of Rhaenys' death in Dorne, so they would seem to represent the black meteor dragons that came from the Fire Moon explosion, the ones which darkened the sun, meaning they killed or tried to kill the sun, and potentially struck the Ice Moon. 
The narrative continues. It was Visenya, not Aegon, who decided the nature of the Kingsguard, seven champions for the Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, who would all be knights. She modeled their vows upon those of the Night's Watch, so that they would forfeit all things save their duty to the king. And when Aegon spoke of a grand tourney to choose the first Kingsguard, Visenya dissuaded him, saying he needed more than skill in arms to protect him. He also needed unwavering loyalty. The king entrusted Visenya with selecting the first members of the order, and history shows he was wise to do so. Two died defending him, and all served to the end of their days with honor. First and foremost, you can see that in every way possible, Visenya created the Kingsguard, who are white shadows with snowy moon-pale armor. The Kingsguard, who are beautiful but unnatural white steel swords that look ghostly in the moonlight. And they were created by Visenya, who likes white temples built of marble and crystal, white marble statues of dragon people, snowy white dragons, and long, relaxing flights around snow-white castles with blue moon banners on the back of her snowy white dragon. She likes making white shadows, too. Who would have thought? The bit about modeling their vows after the Night's Watch is instructive, since the Others and the Black Brothers are in many senses a pair of opposites, or even like long-lost brothers, the Black Sword Brothers and the White Sword Brothers. Night's King was said to be a Night's Watchman, and yet his sons are the Others, so it kind of makes sense that the Kingsguard vows would be modeled after the Night's Watch vows. So, to sum up, Visenya, rider of the implied ice dragon Vagar, mirrors the white shadow factory role of the Night's Queen by creating the Kingsguard, who symbolize the Others, and because Visenya's hill is home to the warrior sons, who also symbolize the Others. Both of these orders of other impersonator knights who are linked to Visenya also have ties to dawn symbolism, as we saw in the last section. So what does this tell us? Well, it really solidifies the identification of Visenya as the Ice Moon Queen, opposite Rainies as the Fire Moon Queen. It sets up Visenya as a parallel to Night's Queen, both of them being creators of white shadows and crystal sword knights. I think it is implied that Night's Queen and King were the first to make white shadows, as I mentioned, although I do want to stress that I think we are still missing a big piece of the puzzle in regards to how exactly a Night's Queen baby becomes a white walker. And that's something that we'll come to understand better, hopefully, when we start talking about the connection between the Others and the Weirwoods. The other really important thing about Visenya being tied to knights who symbolize the Others is that it also sets up Aegon to parallel the Knight's King. King Aegon and Knight's King are both warrior kings who knew no fear. I mean, just think about the cojones it takes to think that you are the right guy to conquer a medium-sized continent that's never been unified under a single ruler. Aegon was indeed fearless. Aegon and Night's King both have a demonstrated and consistent fondness for wearing black, and of course both married Ice Moon Queens, Visenya and Night's Queen, respectively. Put simply, Night's Queen was making white shadows with Night's King, just as Visenya created the King's Guard with Aegon the Conqueror. Or more specifically, we can observe that Visenya created the other light King's Guard to serve the Black Dragon King, Aegon Targaryen wielder of Blackfire and rider of Beleriand the Black Dread, a signature dark solar Azor High Reborn figure, as we've said many times. So, this would seem to be a parallel between a Black Dragon Azor High figure and Night's King. Is Night's King part of the Dark Solar King archetype? This is where I remind you that we have already identified Stannis Baratheon as playing the role of both Dark Azor High and Night's King. His flaming sword, residence on Dragonstone, and Azor Ahai Reborn moniker all make him an Azor Ahai Reborn figure. But he's also a Knight's King figure because of his taking of the Night Fort as a seat, his setting himself up as a rebel king at the Wall, and because of the fact that his relationship with Mel the Succubus is like a temperature-inverted parallel of Knight's King and Corpse Queen. The obvious implication is that Azor Ahai and Knight's King might have been the same person in some sense. Now, I've suggested this before, and let me say it now for the record. I believe that Azor High eventually became Night's King. Either that, or his son became the Night's King, which is symbolically almost the same thing. Night's King was a blood-of-the-dragon person, in other words. Perhaps that's the most important way to think about it. That doesn't preclude Night's King being a Stark as well, and we'll address that in a little bit, or perhaps next episode. Now, the idea that Night's King is a version of the Dark Solar King archetype really should not be a surprise. I mean, it's right there in the name, really. 
He's a king, which is almost always associated with the sun, but the word night replaces the sun with the image of a black sky. That's more or less the exact idea behind the Lion of Night, whose statue in the House of Black and White is a man with a lion's head seated on a throne carved of ebony. The legend of the Great Empire of the Dawn says that when the sun hit its face during the long night, the Lion of Night came forth in all of its wrath, etc., etc., which helps clue us into the idea that the Lion of Night represents the absence of the sun, or the inversion of the sun, or the inversion of daytime. During the long night, when the sun was hidden, the Lion of Night punishes mankind. And so too did the Bloodstone Emperor, whom I believe to be the man who broke the moon, Azor Ahai, since moonbreaking seems to be the cause of the long night. That makes the Bloodstone Emperor, and potentially Azor Ahai, the king of the long night, kind of like the earthly avatar of the Lion of Night, if you will. Compare that to what Old Nan says about Night's king, as remembered by Bran while staying at the night fort. Night's king was only a man by the light of day, Old Nan would always say, but the night was his to rule, and it's getting dark. A man who transformed into something during the night? He's either some kind of werewolf, or this is really talking about a man who transformed himself into a powerful figure at the fall of the long night. And we know who that is, Azor Ahai, who underwent some kind of transformation or death transformation to become Azor Ahai Reborn, the dark solar king and possible zombie. It's also a description of the Bloodstone Emperor myth, which tells us that the Bloodstone Emperor seized power through dark magic at the fall of the long night. Now, I've always proposed that Azor Ahai slash the Bloodstone Emperor came to Westeros during the long night. Or else who cares, right? Plus that few stone fortress and the dragon steel of the last hero. So it seems possible that whatever magical deeds were done to provoke the long night by Azor Ahai the Moonbreaker may have been performed in Westeros. Perhaps on the Isle of Faces? That's probably a topic for another time, though. The point is that the idea of Azor Ahai coming to Westeros in some capacity provides the conveyor belt of plausibility by which he or his son or brother can become the Night's King. What I'm saying is that these three, Night's King, Azor Ahai, and the Bloodstone Emperor, are at the very least the same King of Night archetype, and indeed, they may all be the same person or members of the same family. Let's consider how some of these parallels line up. Night's King has the Corpse Queen for an Icy Moon Bride, Aegon the Conqueror has Visenya for an Icy Moon Bride, and Rhaegar, the Black Dragon figure, has Lyanna Stark of the Blue Winter Rose for his Icy Moon Bride. It's a pretty similar pattern every time. Night's Queen makes White Shadow others with Night's King. Visenya makes White Shadow Kingsguard with Aegon, and Lyanna makes Jon Snow the Ice Dragon that was promised with Rhaegar and those three king's guard outside the Tower of Joy at John's birth also add to the other's white shadow symbolism, as does the presence of Dawn, the white sword. I think this is one of the main purposes of Martin creating symbolic parallels through his writing. It allows him to tell a story that rhymes, a story that has synergy and balance and rhythm. It also provides him with a great way to hide the clues needed to solve the various delightful mysteries in the books. Obviously, if Azor Ahai was also the Night's King in some sense, then we can see a new and most important of love triangles emerging. Nissa Nissa was Azor Ahai's fiery moon bride, and Night's Queen would have been his icy moon bride, his other queen. He called forth dragon meteors with his fire moon bride, and he almost certainly made some little dragon babies with her as well, babies that could grow up to be the last hero or founders of certain great houses. And with his ice moon bride, Night's Queen... He made the others. Alternately, as I said, we might have a father-son duo or pair of brothers playing these roles. I don't think the signs are clear enough to draw these conclusions in any kind of firm way as of yet. But again, the important hypothesis I want you to consider is that the others were created when a blood of the dragon person of the Azor Ahai lineage placed his fiery dragon seed in the cold womb of the corpse queen, known as Night's Queen. The others can therefore be thought of as frozen dragons, and not just in the sense that they symbolize cold meteors and thus ice dragons. I mean that if Night's King was the blood of the dragon, Azor Ahai or his son or relative, then the others are kind of like frozen dragon spawn, or frozen blood of the dragon people. Perhaps that's where the burning cold of the others comes from, a twisting of the affinity for fire which flows in the blood of the dragon into an icy medium. 
I'll have much more on this to come very soon, but consider again that white marble statue of Baylor the Blessed, a symbol of an ice dragon statue whose temple holds knights with mirror armor and crystal star swords. Or think of Sir Barristan in his white enameled plate armor, hard as ice and bright as new fallen snow, which is at times completed by his white dragon-winged helm. Barristan is simultaneously a white shadow and an ice dragon person, in other words. And he's in service to an Azor High Reborn figure with a black dragon, Daenerys Targaryen. The white dragon is a symbol that we'll need to spend time unraveling, but we can see at a glance that it can certainly imply some combination of dragon symbolism and other symbolism. I would explain this and other such correlations that we'll be talking about in the next few episodes as expressing the idea of a blood of the dragon person, Night's King, creating the others with his ice priestess, Night's Queen. I've actually seen a few versions of the Others Are Frozen Dragon Lords theory in the fandom here and there, and yes, I think that's what's going on here. That seems to be one of the primary implications of this grand symbolic puzzle of the Kingsguard serving as analogs of the Others. The Kingsguard were created by a black dragon and an ice queen, and the same is true for the Others, I think. That's my theory anyway, and I'm sticking to it. And for those of you who are fans of the show, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me to see that their version of Night King rides a whited icy dragon. The show Night King is definitely not book canon, of course, but if Azor High making the others is book canon, then it may well be that George passed along something to that effect to Dave and Dan, the producers of the HBO show, who imagined that as Night's King being a dragon rider. So now, picture King Aegon and Queen Visenya after the death of Rhaenys and the creation of the Kingsguard as an archetypal scene of Night's King and Queen. Picture Aegon sitting the Iron Throne in his black armor as the Night King, surrounded by white shadows in snow-white armor that do his bidding, with Night Queen Visenya at his side. Rhaenys the Fiery Moon Queen is dead, but her shadow haunts the Solar King, just as the Fire Moon's death turned the sun dark, and just as Azor High was transformed by whatever horrendous blood magic thing that he did with Nissa Nissa. The point is, with both Aegon and Night's King, we see a dark solar king surrounded by white shadows and accompanied by an ice moon queen. Consider the very end of the conquest section of the World of Ice and Fire, which I withheld from you earlier, and we see the same pattern minus Visenya. Aegon goes to Old Town and ends up being crowned by the High Septon, with all the other like warrior sons in attendance pledging their allegiance to Aegon as their king. It creates the same image, a dark solar king with other like knights to carry out his orders. It's also interesting to note that Aegon's sons, Aenys and especially Magor, would come into conflict and eventually war with those same warrior sons, perhaps shades of Azor High's son as the last hero fighting the others. That's definitely a topic we'll return to soon when we explore some of the other love triangles of Ice and Fire in a lead-up to our RLJ, A Recipe for Making Ice Dragons episode, which will be Moons of Ice and Fire 5. Moons of Ice and Fire 4 will be called The Night Was His to Rule, and it is there that we will further develop this idea of Night's King as a blood of the dragon person. So thanks again for joining us, everyone, and we'll see you next time for more mythical astronomy of ice and fire. If you'd like to support the show, you can click on the Patreon link at LucifermeansLightbringer.com, and you can also help us get the word out by giving our podcast a nice review on iTunes, by subscribing to the Lucifer Means Lightbringer YouTube channel, and especially by sharing our main long night video that is at the top of all of our pages. So long for now. <laughs>